All right, welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is episode number, what is it, uh, 706 or something like that? I don't know. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it's 706, 706, not 706. I don't know. Yeah, 706. And uh, it is a solo episode. Lots to talk about, lots to, uh, lots to explore on today's episode. It's, uh, what is it? It's out on a Monday here, but I'm actually doing it on Saturday because tomorrow I fly up to San Francisco for the last of the Dead & Co. uh, shows ever, Uh, ever. (laughs) I don't think anybody's ever stopped on a farewell tour, even if all the band members are done dead not around farewell tour then they come back but who knows with dead and co i i know that they've done over 200 shows i believe eight years they've been a band brought a lot of joy to me a lot of great memories out there i can't believe it's been eight years i think about all of the uh times i've seen them and always always a, an adventure or a story i remember when i saw them in boulder And I was on the side of the stage. I put a video up of that a long time ago. But uh, my buddy Matt, who worked for uh, O'Teal, or no, I think he was Mickey Hart's tech, got me in and sitting on the side of the stage. This is pre-COVID. And that fucking epic giant storm rolled in. It was wild just to see it from the stage. The band took a break, came back. And it was one of the rare times that they did one set, really, because uh, they started the first set and then the break was so long that they just continued the first set into the second set. So that was uh, a wild memory. Another one was uh, Rest in Peace, my good buddy, Sharuki, who was their stage manager. He was in uh, New York at the Mets. What was that? The, where the Mets play for your, is that the Mets Mets Arena, Met Life Arena? I don't know, but it's where the Mets play. And uh, he said, "Come on out, hung out with him all day." That was the first time I really got to see John Mayer's guitars and amps up close. I walked around on the stage in between the sets and really see the gear. It was so, I mean, that's such a gear nerd when you get to see good gear up close or gear that's been on the road for years that's always amazing to see the patina on people's equipment and you just look at it you go well that amp's probably seen about i don't know five thousand hours on the stage maybe more and you just look at like the tolex or the guitars where the paint just starts to wear off from just the spots that rub on their bodies over, over all those years but that uh, that was an epic day. Got to see all of John's guitars up close and and Bob Weir's and uh, and their amps. And then, of course, some of the great, great shows like uh, Hollywood Bowl, where I was sitting third row and about four songs in, these guys in black suits just walked onto the stage, leaned in. Psh, 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 and the band just put their instruments down and walked off. Nobody said a word. And we were like, what's going on with that? And, you know, and here comes the bomb dogs. I'm like, well, the band's gone. But we're right here ready to take the bomb. <laughs> people people freaked out and left. I'm out of here. Something's going. Something's wrong. And um, and then, you know, I remember just the, the I was in the second or third row or whatever. And the whole row kind of emptied up. They came back and Bob was like, yeah, yeah, I guess uh, something weird was going down, but uh, yeah, let's get back into it. And they got back into it. And I was like, I got my own row, Hollywood Bowl. I think they played two nights that time. I went both nights and a lot of, a lot of good memories out there, seeing them over and over all over the place. And uh, it'll be great to go see him in San Francisco in my favorite ballpark. The uh, Giants play there. I call it Pac Bell. I'll always call it Pac Bell. And I'm ready for that. Go up there. I'm going to fly up. 
God, this is a brutal schedule. It's the only way I could do it. I'm getting up tomorrow at 8 a.m., which, by the way, tonight I'm I'm headlining a, uh, a long show, a long set at the comedy store. So I'll be out late. I got to come home, sleep, get up, fly from Burbank to Oakland, ride the old uh, dirty BART over to Oakland or San Francisco. Then I'll just kind of walk around the city all day, get some food and take in the energy and uh, dodge some of the uh, cuckoos on the street. And then I'll go to the show and I'm not quite sure where I'm going to stay yet if I get a hotel or not, because I got to fly out at 6 a.m. in the morning. So there's like a, that weird area, gray area where you get the room. Do you get a room? And you just go lay there and you're just kind of buzzing from the show. Like, God, that was crazy. And then uh, fly back and then drive to Las Vegas to start my residency at the Comedy Cellar for 14 shows starting Monday the 17th through the 23rd. So it's going to be brutal. I'm going to be driving to Vegas pretty trashed. And uh, I'll get through those two shows on Monday and then I'll just rest. It'll be worth it because I do remember the time that I saw Fare Thee Well. And it had Vegas in it too. I, I did the last show in Vegas at the cellar. And then I rented a car and I drove from Vegas to San Jose where they were playing for the Fare Thee Well. I mean, right after the show, I left. So I'm driving through the night. I'm fucking dozing off and shit. And I get to San Jose, I don't know, like five in the morning. So it took fucking forever to get, get from Vegas to San Jose. And I just pulled into some side street and slept in the car for like four hours. And then met Joey, my uh, good buddy, Joey DeBono. And we went in and saw Fairly Well, where we uh, snuck into the owner's box, the owner of the 49ers box, and just ate some of the finest food, just the most bougiest concert ever, just eating sushi, watching the dead. <laughs> it was fucking crazy. And then after the dead played, I drove home to L.A. Fuck. And I remember driving home and I got halfway up the five and I just pulled into some truck stop and was sleeping in the car, waiting for a serial killer to knock on the window. Those truck stops, uh, the, not the truck stops, the resting areas are so spooky, man. They, I feel like they're, they're definitely serial killer training, training grounds. None of the bathrooms have doors on them. Nothing. It's just fucking spooky city. They still got drinking fountains there. Oh, man. Anyway, so it's funny. The older you get, the more you need sleep. You're like, God, I think I can do this. And then you're, you're in the middle of it. And you're like, I'm so fucking tired. You know, no, no fucking Coke or speed. I don't even do caffeine. So you're just like, you're going on adrenaline and then it just crashes. So anyway, that's what I've got going. So I'm doing the episode right now on the Saturday afternoon. It's a uh, hundred degrees out and uh, I'm just chilling here at the house. I will tell you, um, I've been in a little bit of a funk. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to exercise and eat clean through it, but uh, it's definitely just a uh, a massive funk, man. Over the last, you know, six months, of course, my mom passed away and all that, but it's just kind of, uh, I don't know what it is, you know? And I'm just trying to work through it by clean living, exercise, and uh, try to keep my... Uh, my brain together and, and stay positive. It's just been a, a serious funk. It's weird. Like there's these big highs of touring with Bill and just having a great time. And then there's these uh, massive lows of like, what is going on, you know? And you, you, you start to think about that a lot because I was, I was thinking about it. Like 
to be honest, if I didn't have these Bill Burr shows this year, I really wouldn't fucking have very many shows, uh, stand-up shows, which is fucking scary, man. And I'm working twice as hard. I'm like writing, I'm trying to get funnier. And I just feel like I'm constantly begging for uh, spots, which is just, uh, it's brutal. But that's just the honest thing of the business. So, you know, I always like to get it out there because I don't want people to think like, man, you fucking made it. You're touring with Burr. Hell yeah. It's a fucking dream come true. But without Bill, uh, there would really not be that much work going on, which is scary as fuck. And I do not like to rely on Bill because I don't want to put that that weight on his shoulders because I'm sure he wants to help other comedians, too. But uh, I will tell you that, you know, the honest truth is just like I can't fucking seem to get any uh, bookings. You know, I, I work a couple nights a week at the store and uh, and I do some shows at Flappers in town. But on the road, man, it's uh, it's a uh, it's definitely fucking dried up. And that is for sure a. uh a uh you know the fact that there's no manager or agent has a lot to do with that i don't have anybody in my court going here we need dean here 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 and here and so it's been rough man it's been scary and it's uh it's definitely thrown me into a funk my mom passing and uh and the the fear of not being able to work. That's the problem with comedy is other people uh, make the calls if you're going on stage or not. Sure, you can book your own gigs and you can rent halls and all that, but that really only works if if the people come out. Uh, if they come out, then you have all the power in the world. You know, you go, hey, I'm going to be in San Diego on Thursday, uh, I'm doing a one nighter at such and such. And, you know, if the people come out, it's fucking gold, but it's a double edged sword. You start selling out rooms, then the agents want to start working with you. And the managers are like, oh, this guy's fucking doing good. Let's grab him. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a uh, it's a fucking funky time right now for the old Delray. But uh, I'll never stop. I just keep fucking going. I keep writing, trying to get funny and try to stay positive. But uh, that's just the uh, honesty of where I'm at in the uh, year number uh, 13 and a half of uh, my comedy career. I'm not going to stop. Yeah, I always I always think about the people that stop and they never know, like, Fuck, it could have been it could have just been right around the corner, buddy. And I, I don't want to stop because I fucking love it. It's just uh it's fucking hard, man. It is hard. I fucking I'm working at it, man. I'm working at it. If you want to help at all, something simple as uh review and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or uh YouTube and uh spread the word to everybody on your uh, social media platforms. That is the biggest thing you could do or join the Patreon. Speaking of that, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey, Brian Spink. Thank you, my man, brand new Patreoner. And if you are a Patreoner, I will be um, talking all about the Dead & Co. show on the bonus episode on Tuesday on Patreon. So that's where I'll be talking about that dead and co experience. Um, let's get into some more of the show. I've saw some amazing documentaries this week. I've been trying to watch a, uh, a lot more stuff lately. It helps with the writing and keeps the, uh, the gears, you know, spinning. And I started thinking, you know, years ago, still I am addicted to Led Zeppelin, 
live Led Zeppelin mostly. Bootlegs. There was a time where I owned almost every one of their shows on bootleg CD. And uh, I went to Japan, went to Shinjuku, and bought all kinds of those Japanese bootlegs. I was just obsessed with it. I have a book. It's in here in the house. With uh, it's all of the Zeppelin live shows reviewed, and and what versions of the bootlegs to buy and everything. It's about twenty years old now, so it's pretty dated. But it was a great, great book. It was like a Bible that told you which versions were uh, audience recordings and what were soundboards. And I was obsessed with Zeppelin. Still am. I still think they're the top five for me of all time as far as live they were kind of uh on to that kind of early grateful dead type of thing also where no show was the same every night they would take songs like since i've been loving you and no quarter and you know these long long fucking journeys on these songs these jams that were just crazy song remains the same uh no quarter, just really bizarre, bizarre versions that were not even, you know, the same as the record at all. They, they sounded the same, but then they would just take you for a ride. And it got you, uh, it got you obsessed if you were like me, of like, fuck, listen to this. This is LA Forum 77. Listen to this, Eddie. This is a famous one. Eddie Van Halen was there or something, you know, or or check this out. It's fucking three nights in Australia. And it. so my point is, I got obsessed with it and I would listen to all of them and I would know different, um, different intri intricate differences or what, what is that word? And, and intric intricacies. <laughs> I'm, I am not smart. I'm, I'm thinking of that word and I can't fucking remember it right now. But I would listen to all the different years and I would go, okay, this is how they played in 69. It was totally different in 72. And then 75, Jimmy breaks a finger and he's different then. And then, you know, Plant's voice starts changing from... 70 to 77 then there's 80 which is the last 13 dates in europe and before bonzo dies and that's a weird version where they kind of wrangle it back in and they're not really jamming anymore and they're just being like a fierce fucking rock band with weird flange on the drums on the recordings and all these different eras and different versions of zeppelin which makes it just fucking great and uh I know there's people out there way more obsessed than me that know everything, you know, uh, you know, Jimmy used this guitar pick and then he changed his tube on the amp to this one. And that's why he sounds like that. And then Robert, you know, he fucking, after this happened, his voice was kind of fried. Oh, and then he broke his leg or whatever in a car crash. And, and then this hap they all have these crazy things. And you get uh, you get around those people. And my point is, long uh, way to the story is there's this documentary out called Mr. Jimmy. Now I had heard of this guy a couple years ago, and I was uh, I looked at it and it was it's basically this guy in Japan. Okay, he hears Zeppelin. I think it's Zeppelin Four immediately becomes obsessed with Jimmy Page and turns his life 100% into becoming Jimmy Page. Learning to play exact to Jimmy, then buying the exact instruments that Jimmy used, then buying the same amplifiers, then hiring this seamstress woman in Tokyo to make all of the outfits that Jimmy wore exact, the 69 uh, kind of pink burgundy velvety pants 
with the ascot and the shirt. And then, uh, of course, the opium poppy pants. Then my favorite, everybody knows, the dragon pants, the whole dragon suit with the jacket. Then the bolero era. And um, this guy goes full on and becomes Jimmy Page, gets three other guys and starts doing weekends in Japan playing Zeppelin shows. And they pick a night like 77 LA form and they would play it exact. All of the little nuances, all of the little raps that plant might do the moves. And he did this for years. And then one day, Jimmy page comes to the gig and it's just at this little club that holds like 50 people, like the baked potato in LA. And he did it every weekend, I guess. One day Jimmy shows up, Jimmy's just fucking blown away. And watches the two and a half hour show. He's just, he can't believe what he's seeing. He, he, he thanks the guy. The guy speaks no English, Mr. Jimmy. And basically just, you know, leaves. And then Mr. Jimmy's married. And Mr. Jimmy's wife goes, you need to move to L.A. And just fucking start going for it. Now, I can't even tell you how interesting this documentary is. It is mind boggling because of the guy's obsession. And it is uh, a strange thing when you're in a band or you're, or you're even if you just work at your job and you're obsessed with it. Like I remember I worked at Harley Davidson and I was so into it and the other people weren't. And you're just kind of like, Hey man, we're, we're selling motorcycles. These are fucking two wheel freedom machines. These things are the greatest, man, motorcycles. And people, if they weren't into motorcycles like me, they're like, yeah, who cares? It's just a paycheck. So this guy is so obsessed, man. He moves to LA, he joins a, a Led Zeppelin cover band called uh, Led Zeppelin. And he starts just taking control. No, you must play exactly like this. That's wrong. You've got to do that. And eventually just kind of gets the guys up and running. But the dudes, they know they're just in a cover band. They're like, look, dude, we're doing a Led Zeppelin tribute, but they don't have any, you know, any illusion that they're going to be the biggest band in the world. They're just doing this and picking up some money. But Mr. Jimmy has these, this vision of like, we can make this huge. And he's got a manager who started, uh, he was part of the uh, creation of Tokyo Disneyland. So the manager's like, yeah, we can really get this going. Now this is, sounds like a long winded story, but I'm just trying to give you the insanity of what this guy, I, I get it. His, his mind was like, it must be perfect. And that's a, a cool thing in the Japanese culture, everything was perfect with him. The outfits, the guitars, the tone, everything. He, and he thought, if I have everything perfect, you guys should too. It is a wild story, man. It is a wild story. From how he found this woman that could make the outfits, which I wanted to talk to him about it, just so I could get a dragon pants suit. If I ever shot a comedy special, I'd just wear the dragon pants, call the special dragon pants. But, you know, he finds a guy who can modify the amps, exact to Jimmy's sound. He's got all of the exact equipment. <coughs> Excuse me. There are questions I had through the whole doc always like, how did this guy get enough money to get all of this great gear? How did this guy get money to have this woman make all these outfits. He worked a day job, but did he make tons of money? And also he left his wife and his mom to move to America. And they don't really tell you if he was still married or, or if he just said, see you later, his wife told him to go. 
So there are holes in the documentary. It's not perfect. But really what you're watching is a man who's willing to do anything for the art. And that's what I loved about it. I've, I could relate to that big time. And I, I I felt like I've, you know, sacrificed a lot of stuff in my life to keep going on something that ticks in my brain of like, keep going, keep going. And that's what he had going. So, you know, eventually the band says, you're fucking out of here. You're crazy. He tries to get his own Zeppelin cover band. He's living in Studio City in L.A., Everything's on the fucking ground. And then one day he gets a call from Jason Bonham. And now he plays in Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin experience. And there it is, man. It's a one in a zillion. It's like that lottery right now that's at 875 million. You probably could win the lottery before you would make it as a guy in a, in a tribute band. But there's a few dudes out there that have done it. You know, those guys like uh, the dude that ended up singing in Judas Priest. And like that movie Mark Wahlberg did, Rockstar. Or um, who else Who else landed that thing where they're in a cover band and the next thing you know, they're singing in the real band. Well, this guy is out playing for a living. They're doing the Greek here in LA and they're out on tour, Jason Bonham and Mr. Jimmy is in the band. And it is fucking, it is a crazy fucking story. There was, a, uh, there was a part in the documentary where the Zeppelin it, it was, spinal tap is so strong. It just lives forever. But the Zeppelin cover bands playing during the day at some swap meet. And you're thinking this guy moved from Japan he had all of the outfits meticulously made exact. He's got the exact amp, guitar, cables. I mean, learned to play for years. And there he is, like, there's like 40 people at this swap meet. And they're playing at the edge of the swap meet. And there's just kind of people on the lawn, you know, drinking like old Miller Lite beers, sitting down between their uh, swap meet, walking around. It's like sun is out. Mr. Jimmy's in the sun. Oh man. It was, it was tough, man. There was a couple scenes where I kind of teared up for the guy like, fuck, I could feel this guy's insanity, you know? Anyway, it comes out, I think in a few months and um, they're doing kind of, there's a website. I think go to Mr. Jimmy's website and then in the middle of it, there's uh, some detail on the documentary. And you can click on it. They're going to be showing it in movie theaters. So check that out, Mr. Jimmy. And you can YouTube Mr. Jimmy. And all kinds of fucking footage comes up of him, even playing with uh, Jason Bonham right now. Like his first gig with Jason Bonham was in the uh, Australia, the Sydney Opera House. Can you imagine you're going from the swap meet? to the Australian, you know, Sydney, Australia Opera House. Unreal. The odds of that fucking guy winning. But that was just, that was just kind of like, I will not stop. And I related to it so fucking hard, man. But I don't have the delusion, you know, of like, he was a little delusional. And I think that might have helped him because if he wasn't, he would have just tapped out, you know. So I saw that, and then I saw an incredible Sid Barrett documentary that comes out, I believe, this week, uh, playing in theaters. And that's called Have You Got It Yet? The Sid Barrett Story. And uh, wow, man, Sid Barrett, another great rock documentary. It was, it was really cool to see early Sid Barrett, you know, his story. I didn't know he was a, a killer painter. This guy could paint. And um, there's way more to his story than just uh, he took some acid and freaked out and then just quit Pink Floyd or they pushed him out or whatever. There's way more to it than that. And uh, it was a really good doc, too. And it, it, it was just so wild to see two 
great, great documentaries on music in one week. I was just like, holy shit, these are both great. So those are coming out and I highly recommend it. Uh, either of them or both of them, of course, you know, uh, that early Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd stuff. It's so different to where they went. It, that's a, that's a crazy thing. Pink Floyd, when they first start, they're a totally different band. Sid Barrett's the songwriter and he's the singer and he's pretty much, you know, the guy in the back, they got Mick, Nick, uh, Nick Mason and, you know, and, um, Roger Waters and you know the guys are there everybody but Dave uh Dave Gilmore but then eventually Dave comes in cuz Sid's just kind of out of it but that early Pink Floyd stuff Interstellar all that the first record I always love that stuff it's so fucking different and you think about like they push him out cuz he's just fucking fried and then uh then you know David Gilmore and Roger Waters start writing songs I just think about that. There's two dudes in the band that weren't even writing songs at the time. And then they, they start writing like, hey, I guess we got to write the songs now. And they write some of the greatest rock records of all fucking time. Unreal. I mean, on paper and with record deals too, they were on EMI. They go, Hey, we're getting rid of Sid Barrett. The label immediately would be like, what are you talking about? You guys are fucking, you get rid of him, you're done. But they go, no, we're getting rid of him. And then uh, I'm I'm going to sing and David's going to sing. <laughs> and they, they don't get dropped. That's fucking crazy, man. And then the label ends up having one of the biggest selling records, or like three or four of the biggest selling records, but, you know, Dark Side of the Moon on the, top 200 billboard charts for like 50 years or something 40 fucking years so unreal check out the sid barrett records too if you never got into that like the big thing on the doc was they were like most people don't even know who sid barrett is which is true if you're a true music freak of course you know who sid barrett is if you're a true music freak and you like a band you go all up and down their discovery. So that was a uh, a great talk also. And I think that's in the theaters this week. Check it out. Uh, have you got it yet? Sid Barrett, the Sid Barrett story. Sid Barrett had a lot of girlfriends too. They interview them all. So funny. Yeah, Sid would come around. We fell in love. Sid every couple of weeks would fall in love. Different girlfriend. I love it. Oh, man. Sid Barrett, also original hipster. Look how he's dressed and shit. He's out there painting. He's writing songs. He's riding a bicycle around town, just like I'm Sid Barrett. Fucking cool. Uh, a lot of music talk today because the, those two docs, and then it got me way back into Zeppelin all weekend and, and Pink Floyd. And I was just loving listening to these uh, bootlegs on YouTube. There's so many great bootlegs on YouTube. You can watch them all, listen to them all. It's cool. Um, but one thing that happened to me, and it, it was funny. I used to have this bit about the song, uh, Who Let the Dogs Out? And I don't really, the bit was kind of like something where, like if you go to Starbucks and the, baristas just annoying you because sometimes you go to starbucks or a coffee shop and they're just fucking dicks you know like, uh, i used to have this bit it was early on in comedy like an early bit like i thought it was genius but they would you know piss me off so they give me the coffee and i would just look at them and be like who let the dogs out ooh, ooh, ooh. and i would just drop that little nugget in their head there's songs that if somebody, you know, drops it, a little nugget of it, it's in your head all day. So you got it now with who lets the dogs out. But the bit was basically then I, wa I walk away and then the guy's like, you know, two hours later, who let the dog, fuck that guy. Just planting the bad song. But uh, who let the dogs out came up on my Instagram feed, the song. And I, I was listening to it and I was like, you know what, man? This is a pretty fucking, this is a pretty good song. Like, 
like as far as songwriting, you're like, holy shit, is that a monster hook? So I wrote a, I wrote a tweet. Looking back on it now, who let the dogs out? That wasn't a bad jam. Just as kind of a funny, you know, thing. And uh, someone DM'd me this Who Let the Dogs Out 26-minute documentary that's out on Vice. And they're like, oh, God, you got to watch this on the song. I was like, there's a fucking doc on the song? So I'm watching it. And it is fucking unreal, the story of Who Let the Dogs Out. First of all, it's a cover song. I'd had no fucking idea that it was a cover song. And I was just thinking like a cover song. So there was this band in the 80s called High Voltage. And they were big in the Caribbean, just playing gigs all over the place. And they ended up getting a record deal. And they changed their name to the Baja Men, which, by the way, Baja Men means man from Bahamas. <laughs> so they get a record deal and they do like three or four fucking records for this record company. And it kind of gets into a do or die situation because they almost break out every time. They got a little bit of a hit, but it doesn't really blast off just enough to where they can keep making a new record. But it comes down to the record labels like, look, this is going to be it. So the leader of the label is like, I want you guys to do a cover. And the guy in the Bahama and the head guy is like, no, nah, man, we don't do covers. And he's all, yeah, yeah, I want you guys to do this. And he plays it for him, and the guy's like, "Fuck no, we're not, we're not playing that." <laughs> it's my horrible Caribbean accent. No, we're not playing that, man. <laughs> I love doing bad acts. No, we are not cover band, man. No, no. Somehow it's like a bad Jamaican Delray. We're not, we're not playing that. We are the Bahamian from Caribbean. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Anyway, the leader of the label eventually talks him into playing it. Now, this is a crazy story. And I want you guys to watch it because I don't want to go through the whole thing. But I will tell you this. The leader of the label, a CD got sent to him by this band called Fat Jack and his pack of pets. And he said it was awful. The CD was awful. But there was this song on it. Who let the dogs out? And it was uh, like a, a hooky tune. It was stuck in his head. And he was, he put it in his shelf. And he's like, I got to have a band cover that one day and do it right. So he has the Baja men do it. And on the night they're about to record it, the singer quits to join Lenny Kravitz to be a background singer. On the night they're going to do it. This is fucking crazy. So then the label guy... He tells the producer, we'll have an audition in uh, the Caribbean and find a new young hot singer in the next couple days and we'll just have him sing it. The fucking band singer quits. Here's another band, the singer quits and the label's still like, we'll just get another dude in there. We got to do who lets the dogs, who let the dogs out. It's going to be here. The label guy's obsessed with who let the dogs out song. So the producer holds an audition. He finds three guys. He goes, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I got three guys. I got a singer and I got a couple rappers. Let's put them all in the band. And they go in. These guys have never been in the studio. One guy's a waiter. Another guy like fucking rents jet skis or whatever. You know, they get them in the studio the next day and they record who lets the dogs out. And, uh, the producer or the uh, label guy is so obsessed with it that he, he insists that the barks are wrong. And he's making the guys do the barks for like three days. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, he's like, no, no, that's not wrong. So he goes in the studio and does the barks. And he's all, now it's right. And so they, they release it and nothing, nothing, crickets. 
No one cares. But he has this idea. He's got a buddy who works in the Major League Baseball world. And he goes, if we can get him to play it in ballparks, maybe it'll take off. So he calls the guy, probably bribes him with some money or whatever, a new fucking Cadillac. And they start playing in ballparks and Seattle, it takes off with a I think it was not a rod somebody in, on Seattle. I forgot the guy's name. And then all the ballparks start playing it like seventh inning stretch or w- when a pitcher comes out. And then the song just starts taking off to where the radio has to start playing it. And it becomes a monster hit. It sells 3 million copies out of nowhere. This dude comes out and sues them, says, I wrote it. His name was Ansley Douglas, and he lived in like the Bronx in New York. He had recorded it and wrote it and had a huge hit with it in the uh, Caribbean in like 1979. It was a different kind of feel and vibe, but it was that song. So he sues the label, you know, to get money. And then all these other people come out and go, no, man, I wrote like who, who wrote the dogs, who let the dogs out in like fucking 74. They had all these early versions of people going, who let the dogs out? Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Look, man, go find it. Who lets the dogs out on vice and watch it. It's 26 minutes and it will fucking blow your mind. They won a goddamn Grammy. They became superstars, the Baja men. They still play right now. They're on like their 30th year or something. They started in 1980s. They're out there with those three dudes they found in the fucking audition. It is crazy. After all these years, they're out still touring, rocking that tune. And that fucking producer, I mean, you know, his obsession. I think this entire podcast is dedicated to people that are obsessed with something, art or whatever, you know. And, of course, we're hearing about the success stories. There's a million, million, million people out there that are obsessed with something and it never happens. And I've seen documentaries over the years. Like, you're like, this fucking guy. Remember that dude, man? He made the horror film. I think it was called American Movie. Oh, my God. He's washing Grandpa in the bathtub. (laughs) Remember that movie? Obsessed. Makes a fucking horror film. Goes on Letterman to promote it. Oh, my God. All the time, all the time, those stories are just fucking cool. They, uh, you know, they, I think they're out there for little nuggets to help people that are trying to do something on their own. And they watch that and they go, see, I can do it. I can fucking do it. <laughs> anyway, you got to see the Who Let the Dogs Out dog. It's so fucking cool. <laughs> uh, oh, real quick. You guys see last week the tattoo episode, the tattoo removal. Great episode. And they offered a uh, a cool discount for everybody. I want to tell you about it. If you didn't hear last week's episode, go back and hear it. Because it's a fantastic story about these guys that have this new way of removing tattoos. And it's not by laser. It, it actually, you know, chews it up and brings it out of your skin where, where laser is just, you know, they're just not effective like this new process. And I'm sure a lot of people have tattoos out there. They don't dig, you know, some ex-lover's name, Samantha, Rhonda, you know, or a, or a misspelled, you ever see those misspelled band names? Pantura, Pantura, or, or Pam, Pamtura. Check out my Pamtura tattoo. Anyway, you can now get them removed. And uh, it's 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 light years away from everything out there. Nothing comes compared to this. Nothing comes close to what these guys are doing. All right. Fewer treatments and way less cost than laser. Tattoo Away offers a natural and organic solution of laser-free tattoo removal. 
Their patented FDA-listed process has been tested and perfected over the last decade with more than 8,000 treatments completed worldwide. No dangerous tools, no harmful lasers that could damage your skin. Nope, tattoo away, which is T-A-T-T, number two, away, uses a natural process to get the uh, ink out of the skin which is fantastic. They've got over 45 locations across the United States. Uh, there's bound to be a tattoo away near you. And here's the best part. Participating locations are running a promotion right now. Just $99 for your first treatment. Head over to tattooaway.com slash Dean. That's T-A-T-T. -T, and then the number two. And then away.com slash Dean and snag your $99 tattoo removal treatment. Turn the page on your tattoo story with Tattoo Away and be comfortable with the skin you're in. And also maybe you might have a, an area that's all covered up that you want to get rid of and put a, a new tattoo on because the new tattoos are so fucking good. Anyway. That's tattooaway.com slash Dean and get a $99 uh, treatment and start removing the uh, bad tattoos off of you right now. It's a great episode. I, I don't want you guys to miss it because I thought it was very fascinating to hear how these guys started this whole company. They built the machines that do it. It's basically kind of like a, a tattoo gun kind of. And they just grind in circles. Go to their website and look at it or their Instagram, Tattoo Away, their Instagram, and, and check it out. That's a pretty good deal, man. You get the old first treatment for 99 bucks. All right. We've got the strike going on in town, so it's kind of a shit show. We've got the writer strike. Now we've got the actor strike, and it's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens I do know that uh, most of America probably thinks, ah, fuck those guys. They're all billionaires. It doesn't matter. It does matter, though, if you uh, like movies or TV, because what are you going to be watching? You know, last time when that writer strike happened, it created all these fucking horrific reality shows. And look, the Kardashians are still around, just making billions off trash. People, I love this stuff. I get it. It's a, it's a, an addiction. But I also feel that it's, uh, it, after a while, it's just bad for your soul. You're watching that shit and you're just like, ah, this is just shit. I'm taking in shit and I miss the good stuff. And the good stuff starts to go away. You know, I saw the whale recently and it's, uh, you know, in the 90s, there used to be a ton of indie type of films like The Whale and all that, but not anymore. It's all uh, Spider-Mans and Batmans and fucking Hulks. And there's people out there struggling to do original ideas, writers. And now they're just sitting on the bench and the actors are out. In the, you know, the prime of the summer movie going. Now. I was wondering, I thought if people didn't go to the movies all summer and boycotted the uh, Hollywood people, it would have a major effect like that fucking Bud Light protest that uh, people were doing. But I don't think people really give a fuck really about actors striking. Like I said, they think most people are gazillionaires, but there's people like me right here. And I don't, I don't act a lot, but I have done quite a few movies and stuff. And it's helped over the years of just a, a kind of little uh, bump in the, uh, in the uh, career. And I think that mostly what we're looking at is it, uh, it affects the smaller people and it affects actors that work all their life and then retire or get aged out which is, uh, you know, a huge deal. And then they don't have that, you know, residual money anymore, the mailbox money, quote unquote. Imagine if the musicians 
actually had a real union. You know, the musicians union has just never, never, ever done anything for, you know, regular musicians. Like that was more of like musician union was like people that played in uh, big band stuff like Broadway and all that stuff. But, you know, the SAG after a union, I'm part of it. It's a, it's a fucking, it's a, it's a powerful uh, organization because I tell you the first time I did a movie, I was blown away. Every Monday, my check would be in the mailbox. I was like, holy shit. Somebody's chasing this down. There's a system to where every Monday, if I worked on a movie for six weeks, there'd be six checks in there. And then for the rest of my life so far, I get checks. Now, let me back that up. It, one will be like $2. Another one will be $8. It might be like $57. It's never more than 100 a year. But if they were big movies, it would still be big money. Because these streamers stream these movies all the time. They stream them all over the world. They stream them in hotels. They stream them on airplanes. They stream them on Netflix, Hulu, Paramount Plus, all of those, Disney. And, uh, you know, those films just get shown forever if they're big, big films. I mean, look, I was in an Ice Cube movie, The Long Shots, and I was flying home a couple of weeks ago and it was playing on the goddamn fucking plane. And I still, you know, I get some checks from that. 72 cents one time I got. One time I got one for a penny. It costs like 50 cents to mail it. My point is, if you don't care or you don't really know what it's all about, I'm just giving you a little rundown of what's happening. And it's really fucks with the small people because the big stars have enough money to ride it out through the the uh, strike. Eventually, something will uh, will come to head and they'll sign. It could be a month, could be six months, could be a year. But the top actors are good. What we're really talking about here are the set designers, the, the makeup artists, the camera people, the, uh, you know, the transpo, the catering, all of the fucking people from behind the scenes. You know, you do a movie and maybe there's like 50 actors on it. Maybe there's 10 actors. Maybe there's four. But behind those actors are hundreds of people that are working in the business, the editors, the sound people, the, you know, everything, transpo, bodyguards, anything, you know, the, uh, the people that go out and scout locations. I mean, there are so many jobs affected by this right now that it's going to fuck up this city for a long time. We're just coming out of COVID and the movie industry is still in shambles. COVID destroyed the movie industry. People couldn't go to the movies and then it changed the way people saw movies. Now they, most people just watch them at home, you know, movie theater shooters, uh, movie theater texters, high ticket prices, $20 candy, craziness, people talking at the fucking movies. Once COVID hit, people were like, well, I kind of just like watching it at home now. And it really fucking it, you know, a lot of movie theaters went out of business. The Arclight went out of business. The flagship of movie theaters in Los Angeles, gone. So we just got out of COVID. Now we got this. And it is fucking, it is, it is gnarly. I am glad I am a comedian and a podcaster first. Because I can still go out and do comedy every night. But uh, holy smokes, man. It is wild. And it was wild to see. Ron Perlman, Mr. Uh, Hellboy, Sons of Anarchy, go off yesterday on his Instagram. I was, I was kind of fucking floored. It was almost like he was uh, thinking he was in Sam Crow, thinking he was in Sons of Anarchy. Some of these guys are, you know, kind of cool. I mean, he was on there like, hey, motherfucker. We know where you fucking live, motherfucker. 
You hear me? You talk and talk about taking away people's livelihood, motherfucker. I was like, whoa, man. Whoa, dude. You're not doing a scene in fucking Sons of Anarchy. Jax Teller ain't going to show up and uh, help you out taking a dude out in the business. You're a fucking human being, an actor, and you're on a social media platform threatening someone, you know, basically almost like a, uh, it's almost like a January 6th type of thing. We know where you live, motherfucker. And that's, uh, you know, the strike ends and all of a sudden Ron Perlman's never working again. Now I get it. He's a, he's a passionate man and stuff, but first of all, who threatens someone like that on a platform? It's craziness, man. I'll fucking fuck you up. (laughs) Oh my God. He was going nuts. And then he had a rebuttal after, like, look, okay, I know it, but hey, mo-, but he still was a motherfucker. And then at the end, he couldn't figure out how to turn off his Instagram live. He was like, oh, uh, uh, oh what the fuck? Uh, uh, honey, honey, oh my God, how do you turn that? Honey, I can't turn on the <laughs> motherfucker, honey. <laughs> I mean, wow, man. Between him and the the nanny, Fran Dresser, I feel like they feel like they're watching, they're playing a part. I'm playing the part of vice president. Wild times, man. Wild times. I was just talking to Buddy. He's like, yeah, we got the strike going on. And then we got the election next year. It is fucking crazy. We got fucking tornadoes and hurricanes and floods going on. It is Grim Reaper out there. It is Grim Reaper out there. (laughs) Fuck, man. Crazy. It is insane. Ron Perlman acting like the the, uh, heads of the studios are the Mayans. Look here, Mayans. We know where you live. (laughs) Oh, my God. Fucking nuts. Anyway. I guess that's about it right now. I uh, hope to see you guys out at some shows. I'm going to do um, this uh, small run, a uh, tour bus run with Bill Burr. And let me see, when is that? In September. It's September. No, I think it's uh, yeah, September. Yeah, here it is. It's, uh, I think it's, I don't know, 28, 29, 30, and then October 1st. Those dates will be on my website. I'm uh, headlining out in Utah at the Boxcar Comedy Club. And then I'm doing the Flyover Comedy Festival in St. Louis in November. I'm looking forward to doing that. It's really, other than Montreal, the first festival I've been asked to do in the 13 and a half year career. So that'll be cool. And that all came about from when I was touring with Marcus King, I was walking down the street and I saw a flyover festival poster and I just tweeted it like, Hey, support this comedy fest. And the guys ended up coming to see me open for Marcus and then asked me to do the festival. So I'm looking forward to doing that. That tour date will be on the website. Also, I have merch. I have uh, merchandise. I have some t-shirts and hoodies and hats. DeanDelRay.com. It's all out there. I appreciate your support. And uh, I can't thank you enough for listening to this podcast every week. Go check out Mr. Jimmy. Check out the Sid Barrett doc. Check out the Who Let the Dogs doc. And uh, support the uh, strike, my friends. Candles are lit, and I will see you out there in Las Vegas this week, the 17th through the 23rd. If you're in Las Vegas vacationing or you live out there, come see me at the Comedy Cellar. 14 shows. All right. See ya.